Great. Uh, maybe I can go. Oh, you can get screwed over one. Great. Well, thank you. Um, I always like to have the panelists uh, introduce themselves. Uh, I think tonight we have really an incredible panel. I don't, I don't think uh, oftentimes you can get uh, this caliber of, of five individuals on, on a single panel. So what I'm expecting is a ton of wisdom from you guys, um, a lot of lessons for, for the audience, um, a, lot of, a lot of great strategies and ideas. Um, let's start um, introducing yourself. So we'll start with, with Tim. I'm Greg Sands. I'm a founder and a partner at Cosano Ventures. We're a Silicon Valley based early stage firm in enterprise and fintech. Todd Weber, uh, a partner at 1011, uh, CTO. Uh, been uh, at uh, 1011 for about a year. Uh, 1011 is a uh, stage agnostic uh, cybersecurity only fund that has uh, been deploying capital since 2014. Uh, as I mentioned, just uh, raised our third fund uh, for that. I'm looking forward Hi everybody, Udi Bokali, co-founder and CEO of Cyborg Software, uh, founded here in Cyborg, went public in uh, 2014. Hi, Richard Seewald, founder, managing partner at Evolution Equity Partners. So we're a growth and early growth stage cybersecurity investor, uh, investing tickets of five to 50 billion, uh, United States, Europe, Israel, offices in Palo Alto, New York, London, and Zurich, and quite a lot of activity uh, in, in, in Israel, so uh, both prior and uh, uh, just about to be. So really a pleasure to be here and uh, look forward to speaking to everyone. Great, thank you. So we'll, we'll, we'll kick it off um, just, just by looking at recent history. Um, last year was a blowout year. Everybody made a ton of money, at least uh, unrealized, some realized. Um, we got a lot of unicorns last year. It was, it was the real heyday. Uh, probably the, uh, the, the climax of, of history when it comes to cybersecurity startups and vendors. Um, this year it's looking a little different. Um, I'll stop there and uh, maybe kind of get your comments about how that's affecting uh, both early stage and late stage startups. Maybe we'll start with you, Richard. Yeah, so when you look at the history of cybersecurity, let's go back 20 years. Post 9-11, we were in a crisis and you know, cybersecurity funding, uh, to the degree that there was significant cybersecurity funding, declined what like every uh, every other time during a crisis. But when you look at returns that were generated in the wake of crisis, post 9/11, post 2008, post COVID, those were years that generated uh, the most attractive returns in private equity year on year. We can go company by company. We've dissected this. So I kind of look at the history of cybersecurity in the following way. You know, the 90s into the 10s are sort of the bronze age of cybersecurity investment, where, you know, there was a good amount of opportunity, uh, limited amount of vendors, but ultimately those vendors grew very, very nicely and became sort of the iconic companies during that time. And in that post-2008 era, I'll call that the silver age of investing in cybersecurity, kind of had the dawn of cloud computing, and the companies that you know today, you know, the iconic businesses that are public, the Optus, the CrowdStrike, the Carbon Blacks, the, uh, you know, companies that you know were born during that era. I think going forward in this environment over next next 10 years, you know where I'm going, it's the golden age of private uh, uh, investing in, in cybersecurity. And, you know, the reason being, look, I think we all know the statistics on the nature of the hack, uh, the increased uh, uh, attack surface, uh, the ability to address multiple vectors now, not just cybersecurity, but blockchain, and on the horizon, quantum, and a host of other areas present significant opportunities for entrepreneurs like you that are out there. So again, I'm gonna you know, put my foot down and say the next 10 years are the golden age of investment for cybersecurity. So, so, yeah, let me give you a perspective from the CISO's perspective. Um, 
Our job keeps getting harder. It never changes. It keeps getting harder. So in the next years, what we see is more, right? More technology, more technology need. Um, you know, our, our software is going into so many new things, right? Both in medical and finance, everywhere around, around the world, we see just more and more and more great technology getting us more efficient. What that gives us is more and more challenges. Challenges we haven't addressed yet with, with companies. So, from I'll, I'll, I won't speak to the investment side, but from the security side, we need more. Right? We need to be able to think the new models. We need to be able to grow. And that's not going to go away no matter what the economy does. We're still going to be implementing technology in areas that we haven't done before, and then there are going to be gaps that security is going to need to fill. From a, I'll take it from the seed stage perspective, which is, uh, I don't think company formation has slowed down. I don't think seed stage investment has slowed down. Uh, not all in cybersecurity, but I, we closed two deals in the last six weeks and we've got two term sheets out right now. Uh, and I think, uh, but it is definitely the case that for companies that as they get to mid stages, they're ready to raise an A or a B or a C, there's more focus on, uh, on fundamentals. There's more focus on growth rate. There's more focus on uh, the correlation of growth rate and burn rate, the unit economics of how much it costs to acquire a customer and how much that customer is worth. So right now, you've got to build uh, solid foundations, go brick by brick to get product market fit, to get sales repeatability before you start to scale up. Repeat a lot of that, except I'd even go back a little bit more generic on that. First of all, like, I mean, at the early stage, as you were saying that, you know, I mean, we need the technology the evolution. The vectors keep coming out. The large platform players have a difficult time keeping up with that. And so this is honestly, this is the R&D function for the, for the entire market. And with that, I mean, you know, at the early stage, you know, not just focus on the profitability, but I mean, it's just the base level, solve client problems, attract new talent, do the basics that are good, and then the valuation stuff typically works itself out. Uh, and, you know, as later stage, you know, the the, uh, the repeatability and the economics kind of do play a more important role. But it is, you know, I, I would just say, you know, I'm kind of with, with Dino uh, as to the, you know, we're only thinking that it's down because of comparatively to what it was last year. And if you look at it, even statistically over the past 10 or 15 years, you're looking at a very healthy environment, you're looking at a very healthy environment. And one, I don't really spend my nights on concern. Okay. Woody? Well, uh, I think I'll wait for later on to kind of give the, uh, you know, the kind of the cyber journey was to, uh, uh, to to never go frothy in good times and to never never overcorrect in bad times, and that would be my advice to, to the to the folks uh, in the room. You know, and I think we'll we'll talk about it as we as as we go. Uh, you know, very optimistic if uh, you know you, you have a good solution for your customer and you're very customer focused. Uh, so especially the companies that have been funded or are, are uh, have a path to funding, I think have a great opportunity. Great. Let's let's talk focus a little bit on uh, on unicorns because just that's just a phenomenon that people are really interested in. Um, last year, I, I don't remember the number, but I think it's uh, it's a certainly double digit, close to 100 uh, unicorns formed just in cybersecurity alone, um, which is obviously um, unprecedented. Uh, again, this year. Um, doesn't doesn't quite look like that. Um, just just wondering, you know, want to take your get your take on on that sort of unicorn phenomenon. Where where is that going? Um, and specifically, I have a question about you know unicorn companies that have achieved unicorn status on little to no revenues um, and are sitting in that sort of valuations right now. Um, how do you feel about them, and what would be your advice to them at the moment? Anyone? So that's a tough one, right? So I'll, I'll, I'll jump on that. Um, look, justifiably, there have been companies that achieve unicorn status because of, you know, in some cases, multiple triple digit top line growth. They built solid products, solid addressing a solid market, and, you know, ha are going to grow into some of the iconic businesses going forward. I think for the companies that kind of, you know, got to that status with a few million of ARR, uh, clearly the next couple of years, even though, you know, well-funded, you're gonna need to demonstrate value and, uh, you know, product and accelerating growth. So this is nothing magic. I mean, you know, your numbers in the end on the next round of funding need to match the type of uh, 
valuation that you might expect to get on a billion dollars. And if you don't, there'll be down roads, uh, down routes. There'll, there'll be, uh, for a number of companies, inevitably, there'll be a brick wall that'll be hit where there'll be hard decisions on next rounds of funding. And, you know, that's a natural part of the cycle. That always has happened. It's nothing unusual. It happens to be just that we have more unicorns now. So there'll be more bricks to uh, more walls to hit. But we'll resolve that as an industry. And there's enough capital out there to kind of rework valuations in the space. And you'll see different types of investors come in and work on restructuring rounds. And that's just an opportunity for more kind of involvement in the industry. Uh, just to hit on the down round side, you know, it's not the end of the world. It really isn't. Uh, I mean, granted, there are some people who might take some bleeding from it, but, you know, it's Facebook did a down round. I mean, you know, it, healthy companies have done it. Uh, and, you know, from a recommendation standpoint, you know, I've heard it from a lot of you guys, it's healthy for some of this to happen. It's healthy for you to really go look inside your company as it's grown, you know, really attach like, okay, you know, whether it's personnel or spend or however you're doing it, is it really attached to your growth? And you know, if you got rid of a few things that may need to be get rid of, got rid of uh, it'll it'll help you on the growth function, or at least it won't mess with your growth function that you're trying to achieve. Uh, but you then get a healthier burn rate, and then all the fundamental structures come in, and then you can achieve the unicorn status in a healthy way, as opposed to you know kind of the, the frothy way as uh, uh, Udi was mentioning. Yeah. yeah, I mean we've seen it before, right? It's not nothing absolutely new, it's just the volume is what it's new, right? There's more companies that were kind of given unicorn status. But, you know, some fall a little bit, but if their fundamentals are good, they get leveled out to what's real, and then they continue on and they're very healthy. Um, let's, uh, let's talk about startups. Let's say they're in the mid-stage, right? They're, let's say they're on Series A, Series B. They're not unicorns. They're just, just normal startups that have, um, kind of grown in the normal course, and they're trying to ride out the current market, right? Um, you know, let's say they've got, what, 18 months of cash. Um, they're concerned about fundraising. They're concerned about burn. Um, what, are some, what are some advice that you would give those startups? I'll start on this one. Um, the, first thing, uh, the first thing that I do is just talk about priorities. And priorities in a time like this are maybe one and two. And anything below number two is below the line. And startups, I mean, frankly, one of the problems with um, companies that get valued too highly too quickly is that they try to do too much. And reducing complexity, being clear about what really matters, and then just eliminate everything else. And to me, that's really the number one thing that a company facing this kind of environment can do. I agree. Focus on mission is your key priority. Anything else kind of, you know, we, we got distracted by getting a lot of other things. Now you gotta listen to your clients who may tell you to go in a different direction or a slightly different direction. But in the end, you know, like I said before, you're really trying to just make sure your business is optimized and the investments you make are gonna be tied to growth and not gonna be tied to some, you know, just side project that, you know, diverts focus from what your mission is. So three things, heads down on product, um, Demonstrating value, often in down times when you're able to demonstrate value to a CISO when things are difficult, you're gonna gain that credibility over the long term, so it's actually an opportunity. And then looking at burn and manage burn, so making sure that, you know, that 18 months, you might be able to extend that to 20 months or 24 months, and just being rational about that. And I think if you pull all those three together as we turn the corner on this part of the, uh, you know, of the, the cycle, you're going to be positioned well, perhaps, to raise an extra round of funding. I would just say that uh, in these times, the, the for the CEOs in the room, the VP Finance becomes a close friend, like a, a good person to, to partner with, because they actually can help you extend that runway that you're, you're talking about, VP Finance or CFO. That, that's a great segue uh, to a question for you, Udi, and, um, and for you, Tim. Um, so what's really interesting is how bigger companies, not startups, how bigger companies are managing the downturn. And here we have uh, the CEO of a leading cybersecurity vendor, CyberArk, um, and we have a CISO of, uh, of a large software vendor, SolarWinds, um, and they can tell us about what's going on behind closed doors, 
What kind of conversations are you having and what kind of decisions are you making now in the downturn? Right, as a public company, I can tell you everything that's going on behind closed. Uh, I, 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 will say, I will say this, I think the, that, that's what I want, if I, can, if I can give it to the crowd here, is, uh, is, is actually that's, that's where the experience comes in. I mean, we've seen the 2008 uh, down, you know, downturn, and some of the folks here were uh, doing other things back in 2008, right? But uh, at the time, uh, the, the, you know, a lot of the v VCs, primarily West Coast VCs, were talking about you have to, you have to suddenly cut and, uh, and go berserk. And uh, I remember we were, uh, we were lean and mean, and we looked at our own business. We looked internally, and we said, no, we were always lean and mean. We're not cutting. And we came out of it super strong because we did not. I mean, you have to look at your own business. I think we apply that same methodology today as a public company. Like, we really analyze our pipeline, what are we hearing from our customers, what are we hearing from our channel uh, uh, partners, and I, and I have to say that, that for us we're, we're not seeing a response in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the real buyer environment. I'm not talking about the funding environment or the, uh, or the stock market, but a, a real change or a real change in priorities. I think Dino covered it well. It's, it's, cybersecurity is still high priority if you are creating value to, uh, uh, to your customers. So, so we're hiring, we're growing. Um, and doing all of those things while remaining very aware and looking at real data, I would say at data that applies to us and, and not just generic uh, noise. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when we look at things, um, you know, always start with the customer. We're always focused on what the customer is looking at, what they're, um, where they're going, right? And anticipating where they're going and making sure our products are extremely relevant to where they are and what they're doing, where they're headed. That's kind of one. Internally, we focus on our internal budgets, our internal spend. We make sure that spend aligns to where we're going. Um, we've also changed models for selling, right? So we're, we've been classically a non-subscription-based model, and we've actually shifted about 20 to 30 percent of our market over to subscription in the last six months because it's better for them, it's better for us. So we are looking at models that work for the customer and really focusing on, hey, how can we keep growing? Also, investment in new, right, and expanding the market in different areas to be able to, um, you know, really grow that existing base and that existing base that we've had. Um, one of the things I don't take for granted is we were very lucky, right, through our exit and our customers loved the product enough to stay with it after a major incident. That's, we're still at 90 plus percent renewal rates, which is sort of unheard of. Uh, but that's because the products are fitting that need. Now that need is slowing, and what we've had to do is invest in other areas to make sure that we grow beyond that. But customers key at just managing, uh, managing the business in the right way, anticipating potential downturns. So just, just double clicking on a couple points here. Um, Tim, are you, given the downturn, are you looking at um, security vendors differently? Are you negotiating with them differently? Is there anything anything changed since last year? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, absolutely. So um, all more because of the incident, not necessarily the downturn. Yeah, you know, what we've been asked to do is look at every one of our vendors from a security perspective. Make sure every one of our vendors is safe. Look at not just a simple questionnaire, but do evaluation. Uh, the same thing that our customers are doing to us, we're doing to our vendors, um, because we can't have something like that happen again. So absolutely focus on the vendors, focus on what they're providing, focus on whether they fit in our critical infrastructure or not, and um, have a lot more scrutiny. Contractual, the incredible amount of scrutiny, scrutiny on contracts right now with all of our customers. And I think we'll see that come you know, across the industry very quickly. They're expecting more SLAs. They're expecting more um, breach notification. They're expecting more insurance. They're expecting a lot of things in contracts that they weren't expected a year and a half ago. And Udi, you said that you're not doing any layoffs, right? You said, said that. Um, there are other security vendors that have done layoffs, right? Um, and, I, and I won't state their names, even though it's uh, mostly on public. Um, what do you think are the consequences of laying off people? Say you lay off 10%, or you lay off 20%, what, what happens? Oh, that's a tough one. So like you said, we're growing, we're hiring, and uh, you know, touch wood. Um, it's always been my approach that that should be like the last resort, and, uh, and 
maybe it's the Israeli roots, like, uh, you know, you kind of stick with your team as, uh, as much as you can and don't, don't make it an Excel. Uh, I'm not trying to give anybody any crazy advice, but since this, this is kind of an advice kind of forum in 2008, as a management team, we cut our own salaries without saying it to anybody. Like, uh, you know, we didn't lay off anybody, like I said, but uh, we, we, took, we, we sliced off some of our own salaries. Uh, and look, we're, 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 we're strong and, you know, uh, uh, you know, six years later went, went public. Uh, so I don't know if it's a magic formula for everyone, but yeah, go to that Excel sheet and, uh, and, and see what, uh, what you do there. The, the, what are the implications? I think there's so much demand for, uh, for talent in this space. We're all talking about it. We're hearing it from our own customers. Like number one thing, shortage of talent and insecurity. Of course, it's also an opportunity for, for new models like MSP and, and others because of a shortage of talent. Uh, but uh, those companies that uh, would, would lay off, I mean, those, those people will find uh, jobs. And uh, if you're forced to lay off, yeah, try, make, make sure you're able to protect the, uh, the, the core of the company because by doing kind of 10% or, or those automatic layoffs, you can, you can think you're taking off fat, but you can lose some muscle that, that will also leave. So kind of make, make sure you, you hold on to the core of the company and, the, and protect the culture of the company. That's great advice. Thank you. Um, we will be asking the audience uh, to ask questions uh, as well pretty soon. So please think of some, uh, some really great questions for, for our amazing uh, panel here. Um, let, let's go over to the investors in the room for a second. Uh, uh, Richard, uh, Tony, Greg, um, tell us what are you doing to help your portfolio companies uh, weather the storm? What, what are some things that you're doing? How are you getting involved? How are you helping them get through this? Well, I mean, the first thing, uh, we even talked about uh, a little bit about how to manage burn function. Uh, you know, managing the product, I, I, can't, uh, you know, I can't emphasize that enough. You want to double down on the product. You want to be as sticky to your clients as possible, and you want to make sure that customer success during these times is, is you know, key fundamental. But, you know, it's also like things to how to get creative on financing. If you don't want to do an official raise, okay, how to take on lines of credit. How to you know work with your VP of finance if you're not friends with them. <laughs> but in some cases, at early stage, you don't really have a VP of finance yet. Uh, so be that you know add to that sort of level of muscle from a financial perspective and how you can help them. But also like really emphasize you know if you have to do layoffs, focus on like the stuff that's detracting from the mission. Nobody nobody likes doing layoffs, but it can make your business stronger and more efficient. And to Udi's point, you just have to make sure you're really staying true to your culture side, uh, you know, which is more difficult uh, to keep doing while you're doing layoffs. But in the end, uh, you know, focus on your clients, focus on solving problems, and then you know, get creative on the financial side if you have to. Uh, we're there for our portfolios to help them in any way we can. And you know, like I said, getting a little bit more creative on the financing to, to lengthen the run. Or lengthen, uh, uh, run. You know, so we, like you, are a large seed stage investor. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, initiate at as early as company formation or in Series A, so we're largely dealing with a very early stage portfolio. And I think the first thing that we do is, uh, you know, again, we've got about 30 CISOs, about 20 CIOs that are, uh, you know, on, in our network. And partly we're trying to get people to have enough conversations they're, they're not always, it's, it's as important for customer discovery as it is for sales opportunities. And so that's one, just redouble your conversations with customers and prospects. The second is know where you are. And this is where I think the whole uh, growth at any price, go big or go home movement really uh, hurt startups. Because you lose the map for where you are. And so every once in a while saying to a CEO, you know, you don't actually have product market fit you're not solving a big enough problem or you need to narrow the scope of the audience that you're talking to. And we had those, one of those conversations recently with a company and, uh, and we uh, dispatched our uh, marketing oriented partner, partner Martina Lachenko, who just wrote a, the seminal book on product marketing for tech products called Loved, you can get it on Amazon. And you know, we basically uh, sliced the TAM in half to focus on operational databases and not the data warehouse because that's where it turned out that 12 of the 13 customers were. So that, that focus and knowing where you are, and then I think, you know, coming back to saying, um, don't, you know, premature scaling is the number one cause of death of startups. And so when you know where you are, 
basically stay compact in anything until you figure out repeatability. And, that, and so that translates into sales and marketing. Stay compact until you figure it out. And those are the kinds of things that we're doing, I'll point out. So, you know, Sequoia and their memos, like RIP good times was 100% wrong, right? The people who are most over their skis are the most afraid and hammering on the brakes. And those of us who help companies build brick by brick into really good companies with great unit economics, we're not that scared and we're not changing our behavior that much. It's just one note on the sales and marketing side, right? It's so important. So you have to remember the life of the CISO. I have my mailbox fills up with at least 100 you know, small companies that want to talk to you usually today. So we're always filling up. Uh, I get it, but I, I can't pick up my phone. Uh, I can't pick up my phone anymore. Uh, my CIO is the same way. So you need to figure out ways to get what we with your partners ways to leverage your early stage development to help you get introductions to the right people. As I told other groups, right, if one of my friends is so recommends you, then I will talk to you, right? But just a cold call will not work. There it just gets flooded with so much. It's very important that you have a very good model to go to market with that doesn't need instantaneous growth, right? You take out one, they go to two, go to five, go to four. So for all the CEOs in, you know, in times of turbulence and in the event you are doing cost cutting, um, you know, focus on, on culture and, you know, I would say focusing, over-focusing on it, uh, mission, values, culture, going through that on a day-by-day -day basis with your team week by week and just you know, instilling the strong points that you have as a business. It helps a lot to kind of get past some of the market noise that's out there and, you know, you may be reading things and hearing things in the market, but a solid, you know, approach to instilling that, that culture is critical. And I'm sure, you know, you spoke about it and that's something that every company out there is doing today to kind of uh, nail that part of the operations. Great. Um, Remember uh, the audience. Remember the questions. They're coming up soon. Um, you know, we, you can't you can't have a panel with, with team without without asking about the solar winds uh, experience. And I know you're you're open and you're okay talking about that. I mean, I've I've often wondered what what the first 72 hours uh, felt like for you. Uh, any any experiences you can share with with the group here? So the first 72 hours is just kind of pure. Uh, that's kind of the way it looks like, right? You're um, so we found out on a Saturday, we got everybody in town, we got people on cell phones, we, this was the middle of COVID, nobody vaccinated. Um, so we tried to do things remote, so we worked probably about, I don't know, like midnight on Saturday. Uh, Sunday we all came to the office, we didn't leave until about 3 in the morning. Um, we published an A10K at 3 in the morning before the market opened. Um, with that, we were actually able to discover a number of things, right? We knew it was on our source code. We knew that it had, had affected our supply chain. We had a very high number of customers that we wish we didn't know at that time. Right? We said 18,000 were potentially affected. It ended up being about under 100 actually went to second stage. Um, so as soon as you see that, and then the news broke on Sunday, so we found out on Saturday, the news broke on Sunday, I think 60 minutes Sunday night, uh, and then everywhere in between. Now, during this type of event, you don't talk to the press. So since we're not talking to the press, the vacuum is filled with an ex-employee, disgruntled employee, uh, people that just want to talk. Um, so things like we talked about on stage the other day, solo was one, two, three. Nothing to do with anything. Nine months earlier, somebody had reported it to my team. Yes, it was a mistake. A password got posted to a public kit over the phone. Things happened. They reported it responsibly. We fixed it. We, you know, I think they posted a blog on it or something. But when the news, look, when, when reporters around the world looking for somebody to talk, those types of people face their opinion. Uh, so that news is everywhere. Don't look at the news. We focused 100% on the customer. 
All right, if I focus on everything bad that was said about me those two weeks, you know, it just wouldn't work, right? So we're focused on how do we get to the customers in the right place? Uh, because we didn't know that, you know, the threat actor had left and they shut down their command control server in October. We didn't know that before that. We're thinking all of these customers are at risk. Well, how do we get them to the right version? So our support queues, and for some reason, 19,000 sticks in my mind. But Christmas ended up being a godsend because everybody else stopped working. We took Christmas Day off, that was it. But we kept working. We, we pulled everybody in the company to answer support calls. And then we had calls from every country in the world. Uh, we had calls from the U.S. because Operation Warp Speed was our development of the vaccine. For any of these customers on the list, what were they running? So those are the types of questions you're fielding. And you're fielding questions from the FBI. You're fielding, fielding questions from law enforcement of all sorts. And then you're attempting to get as much information out of the public that's the truth that you can. So use your national defenders. Uh, CISA was a great partner to the, the research community was very, very good and strong, and you just have to realize that there's some side motivation. I, I, I tell Charles and Kevin they owe me at least a billion dollars for their evaluation uh, from Mandy, right? Because their job was to report extremely good research, and they did. Nothing was wrong with the research. It just, that's what made their revenue that quarter. That's what made their revenue that year, and they wanted it in the news as much as they could. I don't blame that for them at all, right? Their research was extremely solid. They were simply that that's the motivations that you need to deal with. Microsoft didn't want things about Go 365 said that when they were there. Uh, different people, other people wanted to attach themselves to the incident, so they were there. So you got a lot of different things and a lot of moving parts. And then, you know, our work was to try to get things better. About four months in was the first time somebody said something nice to me. Uh, <laughs> I'm sitting on a panel like this, virtual, and a woman, so I introduced myself on the panel, a woman from the House of Representatives there, and she said, oh, Tim, before we start, I just want to say something. I'm like, oh, no. Uh, what she said is, thank you. She said, thank you. Thank you for being honest. Thank you for being open. Thank you for being transparent. Thank you for being an uh, example. So, that was, but that took four months, right? And thank you for sharing that story, really, yeah. thank you. I'll, I'll say thank you, too, for it to you. I mean, you, you look creative. <laughs> one, of, one of the other side benefits is that I put millions into the security budget of every company in the world. So, <laughs> well, that too. <laughs> Wonderful. And you, have, you can't have a panel uh, now with, with Udi on it without Udi telling us at least a little bit about CyberArk Ventures. Oh, what, what, I, what, I, what I should change, but Tim, I also want to say thank you for, because I think you were helping the industry. That transparency, what you just did, transforms the industry and educates everyone and seeing the, uh, the other side. So I really appreciate it. It's amazing. Um, so yeah, for, for uh, CyberArk Ventures, so uh, we, we have multiple ways of partnering. We, of course, we have reseller partners. We have technology integration, integrations and, and I have built global, uh, global channels, uh, but we're very plugged into the startup ecosystem and we always felt that we can do more and that we have good insights uh, into, uh, into the innovation, especially going on in Israel. And, uh, and it was actually during COVID that we kind of uh, decided to, to, to really uh, make do and learn kind of best practices of do's and don'ts of how do we create a corporate fund but that comes in peace with, uh, with, with, uh, with VCs and actually lets the VC lead the round and, and some best practices that we wanted to put in place and find some uh, exciting investments where CyberArk can actually be an investor uh, in, uh, in startup companies, bring them value because we have 8,000 plus uh, enterprise customers and, and, uh, and we, we can give them insights and potentially some access to some customers, channel partners, uh, uh, et cetera, and keep it, uh, I would say, remote enough from what we do in identity security and privilege access management, but. Uh, but, but where we can see some integration value and uh, uh, keeps us close to uh, innovation and, uh, and provides value to the customers. I literally had a few instances at RSA, I was so proud, where I'm sitting with a cyber customer and I'm able to recommend one of those three. One of them is Enzo, which is a, also a joint uh, portfolio here with, uh, with YL, that I'm, I'm able to recommend a third party 
company, not as a friend, which I do that all the time, not as a friend, but as actually, hey, we made an investment in this company, you should look at it, and it, uh, it actually created a meeting and, and all, of those, uh, uh, all of those things. So that, that's the, the reason behind. We made three investments. I, I mentioned Enzo, uh, one, the other one is uh, Zero Networks, which is in uh, uh, identity-driven uh, identity segmentation, so it's uh, next generation uh, uh, segmentation. Um, and, uh, and dig security, which is in, in data security uh, uh, world. And uh, so basically we touch network uh, uh, ap applications and, uh, and, and data. And uh, we're going to be very, you know, very careful and always partnering with, with VCs that, uh, that we like and trust. Wonderful. Thank you for your partnership. Let's uh, open, the, uh, open it up for audience questions. Does anybody have a question? And somebody needs to help me with the microphones. Any questions at all? Gentleman in the yellow shirt. Hey, thanks. Um, so, really appreciate the panel and, of course, the transparency and everything that you've been sharing. Uh, while at it, there are a lot of entrepreneurs here or future entrepreneurs, and one of the the big maybe uh, maybe it's even a secret, but. How do you actually make a decision or build that trust to go with a new vendor when you are acquiring a cyber solution from a startup or a company that's relatively small, maybe unproven? What do you really require in order to get that confidence? <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't get the whole question. Oh, how do you trust small vendors, right? So. Um, it depends where they fit, right? If you're fitting in my critical infrastructure, my critical components, say you're trying to, you know, have my data flow through you that is a bank, I'm, you know, you want to be in the middle of all my transfers. Very, very hard level to trust a, a, a startup. But if you're doing a function that's sitting off to the side, if you're doing a function that doesn't end up being, if you fail, it doesn't end up, you know, stopping my business. Those are kind of the ideal ones to start with, that you fail open as opposed to fail closed. Because then I can put you in, get you, get used to you and what you're doing, and then I can you know, move forward. Or maybe I'm putting in a board and installing even a subset of my environment, or um, segmenting in the environment. So those types of things allow me to control the risk I have with a startup. Right? So think about that as you implement. If your implementation says, I need to control the network for everything, then it's like, wow, I need a lot more. Oh, you want to be in my you know, little dev network or my you know, certain set of customers or a certain set of environments, that makes much more sense from a risk perspective for me. And uh, at Cyberark, we also, of course, I'm super pro uh, startups, and, uh, and and of course, we take on vendors from multiple sizes. I agree with everything uh, Tim said. I would say the other side is transparency from the from you, from the founders, from from the company. It's appreciated. You just say, look, oh, you know what? For your scale, I wouldn't start here. I would start there. That always goes a long way. The customers appreciate yes. that big time. Absolutely. So don't tell me you do 100% of things. I really that instantly makes me not trust you. So the hundred percent, you, you don't cover a hundred percent of anybody's environment. So don't say a hundred percent. Just tell me what you do. Right? Make sure you're accurate because you know a hundred percent, every, all, those are bad words for me. So just kind of tell me what you really do and where you are, and I'm fine with it. You're just you know, tell me what your limitations are, and then we go forward, right? But if you start saying you do everything in the world, I know that that's not true. I can just add one little piece to that, you know, from my previous role at Optive, uh, where, you know, you're employing lots of different technologies in lots of different places. Uh, you know, for the most part, you know, the, the honest side is there, certainly, but it's also the interrogation mechanism. You also mentioned that the other side is, you know, it's coming from the trusted source, it's coming from the trusted partner, uh, and that way you can, you know, short circuit a lot of those conversations. Yes, absolutely, right? If somebody you think you've already got is working, and they're happy. Uh, that's a that's a huge, huge, huge benefit to you. You know, uh, what I was telling people the other day is I take about 12 hours out of my time to be able to evaluate a small company, maybe even start with. I can shift that to 30 minutes by talking to you and just say, hey, what do you think about it? I'll be honest. They go, okay, what's it doing here? Show me what it works like. And 30 minutes later, I say it's either fit or not, as opposed to 12 hours investment on the other side.
Hello. Okay. Um, so, Tim, you talked about uh, cybersecurity vendors or startups benefiting from trust and uh, things like insurances or a risk assessment when partnering with a fund. And I wondered if you saw this also uh, working on the other side of the ecosystem as an important criterion for customers buying decisions when a cybersecurity startup is looking to sell. Would you think that something like insurance for performance detection is something that would matter to customers when buying from a cybersecurity company? So at the large stage, you know, absolutely in contracts, we are required to have insurance, but it's really insurance for not at all, right? So it's insurance in case of harm, right? Uh, it's, it's insurance saying, okay, you've done damage to my company. So it, from a startup side, I don't know if that's really practical for you to get into that level of insurance, but uh, depending on the stage, you know, our customers require insurance from us and it, it's necessary for us and they try to require a certain level of, of identification for us. Thank you. First of all, thank you for the great panel. I've heard um, at least from two speakers, um, things which are sound extreme, but I think they were right. One of them was uh, Manny Barzilai, who was saying there's a need for a breakthrough, change of paradigm, and we have to move from uh, horses to cars. And uh, one of the speakers this afternoon, a hacker, was saying, uh, you're, you're all lying to us. I can hack in, in less than a minute, I can go into any system. So my question is, I myself am an opinion that there is a need for a major paradigm shift. You as VCs, you're betting, you know, you're betting for the big ones. Now, if there's really a need for a paradigm shift, where would you get the confidence to bet on a new paradigm when the governments, the big governments with all their budgets are still going step by step by step, unless they have some Manhattan projects. So what role would you play in getting into totally new paradigm shifts because the escalation of the attacks, I mean, we all see it. So how are you dealing with this paradigm shift issue? Or we just wait and see until, you know, the big, big fall. So I'll take that. And you know, a big paradigm shift that is on the map of some, but probably not on the short-term concerns of CISOs is the effect of quantum computing on our uh, encryption infrastructure. And you know, I, I think in that instance, there's opportunities in the market to address next generation quantum encryption platforms of quantum security players so I just use that as an example because I think there are, you know, uh, there are opportunities out there like that and companies being developed that address things that are not on the near term horizon. And you need to expect to spend some time with a company like that until you kind of reach a point where a quantum uh, computer goes live. Having said that, a lot of the companies in that category actually develop technology that hardens the current encryption infrastructure and prepares companies to do that. So that, that's sort of a pathway to where the big event happens at some point in time, inevitably, uh, whether it's three years or 10 years from now, uh, companies are investing in the insurance around uh, you know, the hardening infrastructure today with the view of a potential event later on. But I think that's a pathway of how a VC become, can become comfortable with a technology that may not actually become relevant until a couple of years from now. It's actually finding a pathway where you can sell, uh, sell product in the interim to hard and current infrastructure. So as the, as the uh, resident early stage guy on the panel, not as the facilitator, uh, you know, fundamentally this is what we're betting on. I mean, what the governments are spending money on is completely irrelevant, right? Not even part of the equation because they're always a laggard, never, never at the front edge. And I'll say, 
it, it really comes down to uh, four things. Uh, the, the first is understanding that there's a big unsolved problem. That it just, that, that whatever we're doing now isn't working for, for whatever customers are. That's number one. The second is, is the proposed solution plausible? Does it potentially work? Now we can figure out what the percentage likelihood that it works, right? Now, obviously higher is better, but is it plausible? Does it make sense? And usually we're going to third party experts, they're CTOs of companies, sometimes they're academics or the like. I mean, I had Stephen Chu who ended up as the, uh, the Secretary of Energy uh, at, uh, of the United States, who at the time was a professor at Stanford, come when I evaluated a quantum computing company in 2003. And he said, NFW, it isn't gonna happen. Don't, don't waste your time, not yet, right? Um, the third is, are you working with somebody who has a chance to, um, who just has the durability and the resilience and the insight and the leadership to attract resources, both capital and labor, right? So that's the stuff that we do all day. Now, I think the, the last couple of pieces are twofold. Um, one, I always look for, where's our wedge? Where, what's the tip of the spear? How do you get started? Because if you have to boil the whole, whole ocean to change the paradigm, I'm not your guy. And then the final thing is, um, the, way, the way we get comfortable making those investments is realizing that the worst thing that can happen is that we're gonna lose all our money. And if you're a seed stage investor, it just happens, you gotta get over it. Just one paradigm shift. Add even a little bit more is, is consumption model. Todd? It is, you know, you don't have to always just be about technology paradigm shift. It can be consumption model uh, change as well. Uh, you look at uh, small medium businesses right now, they effectively have pretty much given up on their ability to respond and detect on certain things. So that shifts the consumption model to those people being the users, to the MSSPs being the users who are going to take over their security programs. So you, you don't have to just be constrained to look at paradigm shifts just for the a technologies thing that hasn't been solved, but there are a lot of consumption models to solve too. And I'll add to the consumption model in terms of the kind of behavioral economics of cybersecurity. And that, you know, is trickier to call because it's about the behavior of buyers and CISOs. Often that changes over a period of time. It's very hard to call, but it's also an opportunity to build consequential businesses in spaces where there's a huge paradigm shift in sort of behavior in how people buy. Um, so I, I think going back to the quantum example, uh, in 2003, it was certainly early. NIST put out a paper on quantum encryption a few months ago, and there signals from the government, you know, kind of demonstrate where the market potentially is going in your time frame. So I would pay, pay attention to kind of those types of signals. And, you know, as investors in early stage and growth stage businesses, you know, our, our job is to kind of have that uncanny ability to kind of look in the mirror to see what's coming around the corner to identify clues alongside with you as entrepreneurs and i think what we're talking about all those clues and you know you you have the uncanny ability to kind of build a company around those clues to uh address a huge market all right maybe okay maybe one last question that's all we got time for is there one last question if there isn't, I just want to say that if anybody knows how to solve the ransomware problem, please email me at yoav at wildventures.com. Copy me too. And yeah, copy Richard as well. I'd like to thank the panelists for this brilliant talk. Thank you so much. We appreciate it very much. Now go drink. <laughs>